Welcome in to the Take the North podcast presented by Odyssey. I am Dan Wiedewer, pleased to be joined today by a very special guest. He's a three-time Pro Bowler. He's a beloved brother of the Chicago Bears fraternity. He's the co-host of the Greenlight podcast with his brother, Chris. He's a recently inducted member into the California Community College Football Coaches Association Hall of Fame, and he's our guy, Kyle Long. How's it going? That's a mouthful. I'm surprised you didn't lead with uh, an old friend because you and I have now known each other for upwards of a decade. We were trying to do the math last night, but it's been a long time. You and I have talked bears, so it's good to be talking bears at the real boiling point of the Chicago uh, the Chicago Bears right now with, with all that's going on. So I'm going to get into that in a minute, but as you mentioned, our entries into Hallis Hall both came in 2013. You got there in April as a first round draft pick. I got there in September as a undrafted free agent pulled from uh -huh. Minnesota and off we went, you know, and, and I think we had similar experiences of being new to Hallis Hall, looking around that locker room and going, Devin Hester, Lance Briggs, Charles a lot Stillman, of stars. Robbie Gold, Julius Peppers, and, and having to get used to that initially and then find your place in there, right? Yeah, and I think people forget because, you know, obviously people remember 13, 14, 15. They don't remember uh, what we inherited as newcomers in 2013. You on the media side, I'm trying to think back if I were to be in the media then, um, I would have a lot of questions. You know, yeah. there, was, uh, there was a lot of questions even preceding my arrival to the Bears. I, w I always wonder what could have been with Lovey Smith, and I wonder uh, what could have been for that team because the core as you said you, you talk about Devin and, and Lance Briggs Peanut Tillman and all those types of guys that were there and then they were gone in an instant and yeah. we had to restart and luckily you and I were <laughs> part of that new regime that got to be there in 13 with Mark Tressman and we we had a lot of fun there that year yeah um and a lot of so a lot of questions were answered about Tressman and then there were brand new questions in 14. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going to spin you down memory lane here in a few minutes because I think there's a lot of things from your experience in Chicago that is um, relative to what, what this entire franchise is going to go through going forward that, that you can speak on with, with some really good experience and wisdom on. But I, we have to start with the news over the weekend. And I know you were tuned in when the Bears finally traded Justin Fields and got a future sixth-round pick that could become a four. Um, you had your commentary as – almost everyone affiliated with the NFL did. And then you got probably bombarded like anyone did on social media with responses to whatever your reaction was. But when you heard the news of, of Justin Fields exit, what was the initial sort of feeling you had and the reaction to, to, to what the whole thing was? Honest to goodness, happiness for both parties, um, for all parties. And by all parties, I mean, Ryan Poles, I mean, Justin Fields, I mean, the Chicago bears um, and the, obvious quarterback that will be stepping foot into Hallis Hall as the chosen savior of the franchise. Uh, but look, Justin Fields has put his body on the line. He's been a tremendous leader. It speaks volumes about his character when you hear his teammates speak about him and you can see their visceral reactions to the news. But I want everybody to understand that Justin's going to a better place. Like, you know, you often say he's gone to a better place when in reality, the adults in the room know maybe he didn't. But in, in this case, I think Mike Tomlin is getting uh, somebody who's really a generational athlete and somebody who can mold into uh, an upper echelon quarterback in the NFL. We've all seen it in flashes. And I think just having somebody be able to, find more consistency in that. And then obviously having a, a charter franchise like the Steelers who tend not to screw things up. I think Justin's going to be just fine. And and with Russell there, he's a guy that, you know, Justin emulated his game. He right. talked about this coming out. Russell Wilson, as exciting a quarterback um, and a baseball slash football guy like Justin, there's a lot of uh, comparisons there, except for the size. Justin's just yeah. bigger, uh, bigger, faster, stronger. stronger. So no, it's no. it's going to be fun to see what Russell reaches down into his pocket and hands to Justin Fields in terms of tutelage, whether he does it intentionally or uh, through the old osmosis thing that tends to happen when good players are around one another. You share each other's bag through film, through meetings. And I think that's what people – uh, need to think about first and foremost with Justin Fields. If you love the guy, if you loved what he brought to the program, then 
you can cheer for him just as hard in, in Pittsburgh. And, yeah. you know, can you imagine, like, what's the reaction going to be when he does well in Pittsburgh? Because there's going to be people in Chicago celebrating <laughs> like they won the World Series. And there's going to be people in Pittsburgh saying, my God, we've got a, a great one here. So well, I look, think for everybody it's good. And then the clean slate for Ryan Poles to do whatever the hell he wants. Well, exactly. And, and Justin, in 2021, it was Jimmy Graham who kind of saw the glimpses of Russell Wilson in Justin, the guy who would be very versed in being able to know what that yeah. looked like. And so Justin, you look like he's not going to sulk. He's going to get in there when he gets back from his European vacation or wherever he is right now. And he's going to get in the off season program. Milan. Gonna- he was in Milan. I was just in Italy. You're wasting your time. I'm like, get out in the countryside. You've been in the city, <laughs> man. You've been dealing with the hustle and bustle. Uh, I'm sure he's having a great time. Look, Justin's a, Justin's got a lot of good taste. I like his, his <laughs> sense of fashion and style. I'm sure he's having fun in Italy and, uh, it pro- probably good to come up for air, some European air, no doubt. Uh, before you come back stateside, he'll come back and he'll have a lot on his plate, but he'll give it his best swing, and then we'll see a year from now whether he's staying in Pittsburgh, whether he's getting a new start in free agency as a starter somewhere else. It's going to be fascinating. One of the reasons that we kind of, uh, you and I were texting last week, or more so, I guess it was over Twitter as you were busting my balls, is because. There were a lot of people wondering if there was a, a a possibility with Justin Fields not traded in the first wave of free agency, if they would be tempted to keep him in the building and then have that Justin Fields, Caleb Williams combination in the building. You were an advocate for it. I said, I just wouldn't want to deal with with the noise. And we went back and forth and I thought I'd give you your say. I don't know here. if I I don't know if I would say that I'm an advocate for it, but I'm an advocate for laying out all the options. Sure. And when all the options aren't on the table, you're not doing yourself due diligence. You're not doing the team due diligence. So as a former bear and somebody who literally put my body on the line for the franchise, I mean, I want to find out how to maximize the pieces we have in our jewelry case. And we've got a really big piece in there that's yeah. shiny and it's versatile and it still has yet to be buffed out completely. Uh, but we know the value of it, which is why guys like me say you hold on to Justin Fields and somebody's going to shit. Like, look, everybody, nobody wants to be the, the first guy to step up and say, I think Justin Fields is a very attractive option because, you know, you run the risk as a general manager of, of losing out on being sitting at the cool kids club and people <laughs> tend to follow suit. I mean, it happened with Lamar Jackson, too, and then he wins the MVP. So I'm not saying Justin Fields is Lamar Jackson, but what I'm saying is this. If somebody has that sort of desperate situation come up, Dan who's to say that Justin Fields isn't the answer to that question. And now we've moved on from that. So I was laying, I was laying the groundwork for what could be an option. I wasn't saying this is the best option. Uh, I'm glad that he he ended up in Pittsburgh and I think it's going to work as well as it could have worked aside from the comp. Uh, So I think it's going to be a fourth in my opinion, if Justin does end up yeah, um, well, what like, I think he's going to do. My thought there is that Pittsburgh is incentivized to basically give this a 10 game trial with Russell Wilson. And mm-hmm. then if they're out of the playoff hunt and they're not going anywhere, then you turn it over to Justin Fields for the last seven and you try to keep that snap percentage in your favor so that you're only giving up a six instead of a four. And you have control over that if you're the Steelers. Now, injury is going to dictate some of that. And, and there's a lot of other factors, as you know, that that send football seasons in paths that you never expected them to go. And so we'll see, we'll see which direction that goes. Um, You obviously know what the building is like at Hell's Hall. You know what the city is like here. And I think in your opening comments, talking about Ryan Poles kind of having that clean slate, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you probably have the same feeling that I I have that, that he's got a chance today on the first Monday after this trade to to just take a deep exhale and go, okay, we're resetting now. We can do so with without having to worry about so many different things that we've been worrying about in in recent weeks. And now we can just kind of get that deep exhale and reset ourselves. You know, I understand that uh, we as human beings, we inherit the trauma of our ancestors, (laughs) whether we like it or not. And as Chicago sports fans, we inherit the trauma of previous regimes and bad decisions, or maybe not hitting the nail on the head um, in previous years. Well, just like you said, it's like a palate cleanser here for the fan base. I know some people can't get fully over it and they've still got that trauma that's in the brain a little bit, but the taste hopefully is cleared <laughs> and you'll have an opportunity to taste a new dish soon. And that'll be Ryan, Ryan Poles Amakase. He's going to give you a bit of everything. And uh, we've seen it thus far in free agency. We saw it last year with the sweat signing. Jalen Johnson is a bear moving forward. 
And I think the the fans have wanted this kind of stuff, Dan, and that's what they're getting from him. And God, I, I the options are so uh, they're so lucrative here outside of the number one pick. And I think it's going to be really fun to watch Ryan Poles leave his legacy and his stamp on this Bears franchise. So before I pivot forward to kind of a future looking lens here to, to kind of look at what is going to be next at the quarterback position, I thought you were a good person. And the, there was a lot of guys in the league that are good people to speak to how cruel and abrupt the ending can be at times. Justin's obviously experiencing that this weekend, the Chicago Bears tenure is is over i remember talking to to brian urlacher when lance's career was coming to an end in 2014 and brian said listen like one minute you're chasing russell wilson on a <laughs> routine fourth quarter play his career is over and so there are very few guys who get to go out on their own terms there are very few guys that are ready for that sort of cool i mean cruel and cold slap in the face that your time here is up and I'm just curious how you can empathize with Justin in that regard, given kind of how, how things finished for you here in Chicago in 2019. You know, part of me is very callous to it, but like you said, there's still part of me that's exposed to it emotionally and I can empathize with Justin. And he's a guy that you watch play and he plays inspired football. And he's a guy that really cultivates um, a, a great energy He's a, he's a fountain of energy to the teammates around him. And you can see by the reactions of his guys, how they feel about him. And I love, uh, I and you and everybody loves watching a guy like that. And all we would want is for a guy like that to have a hero's ending and somewhere, uh, a destination that you can have success. And I'm thinking Pittsburgh has a lot of stability and we need an opportunity to clear our, our, our palate. Like I just said, last paragraph, essentially it's, you know, it's a great opportunity for both parties. And um, unfortunately for me, I was I was so uh, I, I was so beat up by it emotionally. And I was so beat up physically at the end that I just I just went I just packed my shit and went home. I was just yeah. uh, unfortunately I needed a reset and um, I got that and I got to go work in the media. And it was really cathartic to see things from a different perspective and to understand that my situation, well, it wasn't unique to me. It's just the nature of the beast. Like you said, I mean, Justin doesn't get closure. Lance Briggs doesn't get closure. I don't get closure. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's cruel. I mean, I remember the day they put you on injured reserve in 2019 and, and Harry, he said something to the effect of, they all know it doesn't go on forever. And it was just like, Holy shit. Like that's, that, I mean, it's a cruel reality, but that's like, you know, it's jarring to hear that, you know, because it's just like a guy that's dumped everything into a franchise as you did for seven years. Uh, all of a sudden it's just like, Oh, well, it doesn't go on forever. Next man up, you know, and that, that part of the business I think is, is probably one that the, the casual fan doesn't have any sort of appreciation for whatsoever. Well, I think that uh, one side of the business, and we're going to put a positive spin on this thing, Dan, is that you and I are in the media. So a lot of these people, they don't realize that their contracts are up eventually, and you and I continue to make money on the Chicago Bears because this is what we love, and we're employed yeah. to do so, and we get the uni unique opportunity to talk, uh, be like, a, I guess, a mouthpiece for the fans and somebody who can help uh, put things in perspective because I know that while fans are just as smart or smarter than I am, there's certain things that I have a perspective on and you have a perspective on because you see us uh, walking around behind the scenes and you get to interact with us that I think is unique and we're lucky to do it. So my positive thing is I get to be part of the bears forever um, until my ticker quits and then, uh, yeah. and, or unless Twitter stops working, because I'm so obsessed with Twitter, <laughs> and it was re I really owe it all to Twitter or X or whatever the hell we're going to call it, because I've had it since rookie year, and uh, I had so many coaches tell me to get off Twitter, and I had so many um, run-ins with the people upstairs, and I, I really stood on business, as the kids would say, and Twitter has a, has ingratiated me with the fans and allowed me to really show my true colors and be myself. And I'm grateful for it. So I'll pivot off that because we're sitting here on March 18th and the presumption around the league is that the momentum is there for the Bears to take Caleb Williams in five weeks and we'll all go, okay, the new era has begun with the chosen one. Caleb Williams is a guy who's lived a lot of his life up to now in the spotlight. He's been very well regarded and, and you know, very brightly lit and, and all of those things. 
your career to me is is fascinating on a number of levels because it it had it all. You had expectation, you had excellence, you had injury, you had recovery, you had resurgence, you had the ending that we just talked about. And so you like you went through the entire gamut of of possible experiences in the NFL. When you think about a a kid coming into this situation, you know this city, you know this building, you know what it's like to be a first round pick and and to have people expecting as much out of you as you expect out of yourself. What do you think when you think about Caleb Williams' arrival and what advice would you give him as he tries to to get his feet on the ground if he is indeed here in, in five weeks? Uh, you know, the, the irony of you saying when he gets his feet on the ground, the thing I love about his game is that he bucks trends. He says, screw your rules. You can't put me in a box. I'm going to play the game how I want to play. And more often than not, his, his feet are off the ground, Dan, when he's making these plays, <laughs> right, right. Uh, throwing the football. Uh, I, I love that. You know, I've always been a guy that, uh, what is it? I, I marched to the beat of a different drummer. Um, I had a unique skill set on the football field as an offensive lineman. And with that comes an appreciation for other guys who seem to have a unique uh, skill set. And this guy, Caleb Williams, jumps off the page to me, um, not only from a, a throwing perspective, but a creativity perspective. He makes the game look like art. Uh, and when you watch a guy where you can't quite, he, he has a je ne sais quoi, <laughs> um about his game he's got it i mean I, I i what more do you want me to tell you i mean you can watch 30 minutes of highlights of the guy and some people aren't convinced but he, he gives me in my opinion uh he gives the bears the best the best chance moving forward at the quarterback position and when you watch the super bowl when you watch these playoffs it's the quarterbacks that have a je ne sais quoi yeah that tend to to win these Super Bowls. And, you know, I got to play with Patrick Mahomes for a year and the things he's able to do, the shapes he's able to shift into, uh, the quarterbacks he's able to morph into at the drop of a hat when things aren't working, when they're dropping eight um, and rushing three and he's got to stand back there and he can be frustrated at times because um, things aren't happening as quickly as his mind processes. He has to become someone else. And, and when they ask him to run the read option, he does it with uh, with relative ease, and he looks like Lamar Jackson. He goes on the road to Baltimore and, and slays the dragon of the Baltimore right. Ra Ravens. He goes up to Buffalo and beats the giant, Josh Allen. Uh, there's just – you need a quarterback that gives you, instead of fear, he gives you faith and hope. And belief, right? That it's belief not a guy that you can win with. It's a guy that you can win because of. Um and I think that's Caleb Williams. Uh, and he is somebody that you're going to love. If you don't know him, if you haven't watched the film of him, just wait. And for the guys on the team uh, that obviously are frustrated, you can't change the past. You can't change the decision that's been made. Uh, your, your best buddy, Justin Fields, your guy, your leader, he's no longer on your team. And that's a really hard thing about the NFL. Your friends aren't going to be there forever. Um, but the beauty of the NFL is you're going to make new friends every year. Right. And I think maybe you got a really cool friend coming down the pipeline here, uh, whether it's Caleb Williams or whether it's Jaden Daniels or Drake may, you got to give this guy, whoever it is, an opportunity in my mind, it's Caleb Williams. It's a no brainer. Yeah. Um, I just can't wait. I, I don't know how you feel, Dan, but no, I mean, look, like, I, I just think it's an, it, it, it's an opportunity that is incredibly exciting, especially for a franchise that has never experienced what this is like to have, a quarterback who can be the engine of a run of, you know, 10 years of, of contention that hasn't been open here since the eighties. You know what I mean? And so, so, so to, to not be excited about that is to just have your head in the sand and be, be stubborn, you know, look, so I, I understand people really like to beat themselves up and people really enjoy this thing. You know what I mean? Like that comes along with being a bears fan. And there's a ton of franchises in all sports that kind of adopted this woe is me, but they really enjoy it. They kind of get off to beating themselves up a little bit. And uh, I feel like we can be guilty of that as Bears fans at sure. times. It's time to go outside and look, put your eyeballs directly into the sun. You can go psycho Joe Rogan, Aaron Rodgers, and <laughs> you don't have to go ayahuasca. Just put your eyeballs directly on the sun and just try to manifest some good stuff because I think it's really coming for us Bears fans. And the defense looks great. Eberflus has his finger on the pulse of this team. And when this guy walks in the building and turns heads, 
uh, day one, it's going to be ob- it's going to be obvious to the guys on the team, and they're going to buy in. And, and hopefully, the the core of youthful, talented players are on board with having their minds change a little bit. If the youth is as progressive as I think it is now, Dan, I think that the number one pick has a chance to to really blossom. Do you tell Caleb Williams to take the Kyle Long approach and stay on Twitter, or you tell him to take the Mitch Trubisky approach and go zero dark 13 and get the hell off of there in the role that he's going to be in? I don't think Caleb Williams needs any advice from me because I think he's a tremendously bright young man, and I think he will stay on Twitter. He will uh, remain uh, face to the public because he understands how, how important his brand is. And also, first and foremost, your relationship with the people who you are now ingratiated with, you are now family with. Um, it's thicker than blood in Chicago when, when you're a bear. So uh, he's going to take every opportunity he can, as he should, to strengthen the bond, to strengthen the relationship with the fan base, because that's the smart thing to do. And I think that's what the fans should do with him as well. One of the things that made you a magnet for us in the media when you were in that Bears locker room is that that you were willing – at times to be introspective about where you were in your development. I, you know, you went to the pro bowl as a rookie, you went to the pro bowl the next year, you were establishing yourself as one of the great players in the league. But at times you were willing to say, look, like I don't know the game of football. I'm just asking what's the snap count and what number do I need to go block on this play? And so what was that transition like of, of using your natural gifts to carve out your early success, but also understanding like, I, I've got a long way to go to, to figure out all this stuff that's going on around me. Well, luckily, I stuck around in the league long enough to be a guy who did understand where to go and who to block and why and how. Right. And I was able to help young men who didn't know either. And I realized that I it was I wasn't unique. None of my problems were unique to me. It's just problems that are unique to the National Football League. And I remember when I had the opportunity to work with Trey Smith in Kansas City, who has turned out to be an exceptional right guard and uh, now a two time Super Bowl winner and working on his third. Uh, but you, you get an opportunity to work with these young guys, and they're just puppies, dude. They're just incredibly yeah. gifted, talented puppies. And that's what I was as a youngster. And thank God for the OGs, the veterans, <laughs> the guys on the team like Matt Sloss and Jermon Bushrod, Evan Britton, Roberto Garza. The list goes on and on and on. For guys like uh, Jordan Mills and myself, who yeah. were – one was a seventh rounder, one was a first rounder. We were best buddies. We played next to each other, and we started every game our rookie Opening year. day starters. Yeah, exactly. Our entire offensive line didn't miss a snap. Uh, the first year, and it was a special year. Um, and that's when that's when you and I met. That's why it's such a special year. Record setting, no question about that. I remember that year. You also saying like the first time you lined up across from Indomit and Sue, it was the first time in your life you ever felt the emotion of intimidated, right? Like, I mean, yeah. am I correct in yeah. that? Like, and, and like we're looking at you, like Kyle Long has never been intimidated in his life, and you're like, no, man. Well, <laughs> I felt you feel human. I mean, it's the NFL is as intimidating and. Uh, awe-inspiring and it can be deflating and inflating right uh, depending on which team you play for and Sometimes i would the say same in the same year right you can feel them both you can feel everything in five seconds you know what i mean you can feel fear the ball is snapped you could be late you could feel anxiety and then you can throw the perfect punch and you can feel relief <laughs> uh, right. but that's just the game and when you play sue you're you're more often than not feeling anxiety and a, a right club to the shoulder pad uh that feels like a lightning ball and your first game was against geno atkins am i right on that yeah yeah it was like i remember we had geno atkins then we went to the bill we played the bills uh it was mario williams kyle williams you know you name it yeah the, I mean, marcel I mean, darius you're a young player you're obviously very driven and very um self-aware of what you're doing well and what you're what you're not doing well how do you manage that when you're in your first couple years in the league of trying to figure out like how do i take my natural level of give a damn which is elite and make it so that it is a plus and not consuming because i know for a lot of young players that can be a a little bit of a challenge you got to take what's yours and make it a strength and use it all the time um that's really the simplest way I can say it. And my dad used to tell me, let your freak flag fly. Well, my freak flag was I gave an, an immense amount of Fs. And yeah, right. I was willing to work hard uh, at it. And 
I wasn't always going to use the right techniques, but I'll tell you what, my intent was there and my commitment was there. And that's what my team knew. And those are the guys next to me uh, that I went to the line of scrimmage with every time we clapped hands and got to play from Jay Cutler or Mitch Trubisky, whoever it was, uh, you know, and that's part of being an offensive lineman. And uh, that's what the fun thing is, right? I mean, it's, it's fun to be able to, uh, assert your will on the man across from you and, you know, the old cliche moving a guy against his will. It's all fun. Uh, it is all fun. What did you when learn you're about, young, when you're young, what did you learn about persevering through struggle? I remember obviously probably most vividly to me is when you got the late 2015 training camp call to switch from <laughs> inside to outside. And it's like, Oh, by the way, the season opener is coming in a matter of days here. Good luck kid. And there's a, a level of, of, trial and tribulation to that that'll that'll uh put you through some struggle that as a young guy you got to figure out a way how to how to push through that and i remember you and david magazine talking pr pretty deeply about just just getting through that initial wall to to get that comfort level and realize that you are capable of doing this at a high level yeah i mean i always had belief that i could do it and coming into the league uh there were people talking about me playing tackle and i was comfortable with aaron Cromer's plan to keep me a right guard and uh, I had bought into his prioritization of the internal section of the pocket, the interior being the real strength of the shield. I and mean, people talk tackles all day, but they run guys by. You got to fight the fight in the middle. So Aaron Cromer, I'm of that school of thought. And uh, I was lucky to play for him uh, the first two years. I was a rookie pro bowler, and then I was an all pro my second year. Yeah. And uh, I, I I, I didn't have a lot of fear in my second year, regardless of who I played. I mean, I was kind of there were there were times when I was kind of getting bored playing right guard. And when <laughs> I, when Jordan Mills was released going into the third year, I saw it as an opportunity to increase my value as a football player and an opportunity to increase uh, our value as a football team because we didn't have a guy who was going to step in and play right tackle that. I would want to play next to, uh, essentially. And I had the opportunity to play tackle. I did it. And I gave up a sack in each of the first four weeks. I had Julius Peppers. Uh, he broke two of my fingers on my right hand my in the first game. Right. And I was like, this is going to be hard, but I'm going to be better for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, good. Uh, Julius <laughs> Peppers game one. I forget who else. I had Von Miller that year, Khalil Mack, Cliff Averill, um, you know, you name it. Uh, I played I a lot of them, and a Rich. lot of them I didn't give sacks to. I think you showed our guy, poor little looker out for Rich Campbell, that your finger after that Green Bay game, and he came back to the press box after that game and said, holy shit, like that, that, thing, <laughs> that thing was sideways, right? Was that, isn't that the injury, or was there another finger injury that I'm mistaken? No, uh, the, fingers, uh, on my, the fingers on my right hand, this one and this one, were laying on top of – my hand they were just sitting back here with my glove on so my glove right. was like stretched in the palm and i put them back uh and i didn't want to use my right and trying to block julius peppers even if i had four hands would be impossible so trying to do it with one hand was even tougher i gave up another sack and then uh each of the first three weeks i gave up a sack and people were ready to, you know, send me to the train station, but I just stuck it out and stuck with Coach Magazoo's prep. And, you know, God rest his soul. He was somebody that he didn't exactly put me at ease uh, throughout the course of the week. <laughs> I think he had more anxiety than me, but he made it uh, a lot of fun to play and he made it a challenge every day at, at practice. Uh, but yeah, being a guy who says I can do it is the biggest honor in the NFL. Um, you know, I mean, I just think of it's not often an offensive lineman gets to do something outside of just what they do. So, uh, I think about Zach Martin and guys right. like that who can switch positions at the drop of a hat. Um, and it's cool, man. It's something I wear as a badge, as a badge of honor. I got to go to Hawaii as a, as a tackle too. Right, right. I was talking to Dre Bly at the combine and I said something to him like, you know, people don't realize it isn't always easy to be an NFL player. And he stopped me abruptly and said, said, look, man, it's never easy. Right. And, and and so I think the challenge for guys who have been successful their whole life and things is getting to that level and realizing, man, like this is a, this is a daily grind. And I'm going to read you a quote from Charles Bentley. Um, and this was, this was about you because I remember having the, the talks with you about the off season work you did 
out in Arizona with the Charles and, and being in that group, it was the Sharks group. God, he was great. That was the best thing ever. I wish it was like, I wish I could just stay there in a time capsule with that group in that moment. Like, I, I literally have goosebumps on my arms right now because I you know, was reading this in one of the stories I wrote about you back in the day. And, and he said that, that he sat you down and he said, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go to explore the depth of your potential? And you knew if you know the Charles Bentley, you know how how a question like that resonates you know and, and yeah. it's like uh, okay and like for you, yeah, you I remember just you... finished vomiting in the parking lot <laughs> uh with him working out and you've got you got two more hours of, of uh bonding with your guys and i mean yeah with charles bentley he he took me and and so many countless players and still does uh takes people to a place uh, beyond their comfort zone in the best way possible. He, he's, he's one of these guys that can, you, you come to him a boy and you leave a man when you leave out of his place. So that, that's some I'm of the secret sauce family. to this, right? Like, I mean, it, it is finding someone that can push you beyond where you think you can push yourself. And I bring that up just because I feel like with, you know, like you, you had said something to me to the effect of like the, it's, the off season's a sacred time for players. It's time to go vacation, spend time with your family. Well, well you're at the time, a you know, a mid twenties guy without a family. And you said, other guys can have cool Instagram feeds. Like I'm going to go bust my ass to try to become the best football player I can be. I and wanted then- to come get built like an ox. And I knew that the best person to do that with was the Charles Bentley. And, uh, I knew that I would be surrounded with, uh, other Wagyu beef cows. And <laughs> not only we would be hitting it hard in the weight room, but we'd go out and eat really good places together. And we would, uh, you know, if, if we had girlfriends, they'd be around. We'd, get them all around one another. It's a fraternity, man, this, this NFL. And there's subcultures within the NFL, the offensive line being one. And then within the offensive line, there's so many places you can train um, on, as an individual. But uh, as a group of men from different teams uh, under one flag, and that was the, you know, the way that LaCharles Bentley did things. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it was cool to kind of feel the results of the things you talked about during the off season or training camp. And then you'd watch him on the field and you go, man, like dude is locked in and he's mauling people and, and, and it's making a difference. And I know there was just a great sense of pride within your whole line group when you guys would get in those zones and play that way. A uh, couple other topics before I set you free here, obviously you played for three different coaches here in Chicago, Tressman, Fox, Nagy. At certain moments of every one of those regimes, it was hell yeah, we are on the yep. right track. We are going in a direction that that Chicago feels proud of. Like literally, you can feel 100%. the energy. And then there's moments where you could feel it shift to uh oh. I'm curious how you can kind of describe the highest of highs that that you felt here and, and what that mean. And then and then how is a, a a team you know when the car is kind of shifted in reverse and it's going funny because the highest of highs and the lowest of lows for somebody from the outside looking in not in my shoes are different than the ones that i have um so like i remember us i'll do strange lows for me i'll okay. start with strange lows strange low is sitting uh standing in my locker watching the team wear the nfc north champs hat uh and, and not and not being part of the real celebration being part of the group right um that was as difficult uh, a time for me as a bear. Um, strange low playing in London because I was playing hurt. I was playing with a torn hip flexor and I just, I couldn't even lift. Like I couldn't drive my knee towards my boob. You know what I mean? Like if I'm trying to right. go sprint somewhere, I just couldn't. And I let alone dr- like drive somebody out of the hole and I got abused the whole game. I got beat. I got bullied. And that was awful. Like feeling like, I couldn't, I just couldn't get the job done. You know, we flew all this way and I couldn't get the job. Done. Like it was embarrassing. Right. My, my now wife and mother of my two beautiful daughters was there and having a great time uh, <laughs> with my mom and, and, and her mom in Europe. And you're not you know, next thing you know, I'm not on the team when I get back, right. uh, essentially, they tell me not to come back. So that was a strange time, but the highs, uh, you know, getting an opportunity to step into the meeting room, my rookie year, uh, with such an elite cast of minds in terms of the staff on the offense and then the talent with which I shared the huddle. Uh, you look across and it's Alshon Jeffrey, it's Brandon Marshall, Matt Forte, Martellus Bennett. The offensive line's going to not miss a snap. We're all going to play together. Jay Cutler's our quarterback. Devin Hester's returning punts and kicks. 
this is this is the squad. Like, right. Show us our opponent. <laughs> like, who are right. we playing? Right. Um, is this a Pro Bowl game? Uh, it's record setting. You know, all and, and, and we, and, you know, the way with which we lost in Week Seventeen, I believe yes, it was. It was not eighteen, right? It was seventeen. No, it was still seventeen back then. Yep. And I remember, I remember not being terribly bummed after that game, and because I'm so fucking stupid, and I was like, "We're gonna be back, <laughs> right?" Um, and we and we weren't. And For five after years. that, it was like, uh, man, we went three and thirteen the next year. I think it was enough to cost people their jobs. Uh, five and eleven. Five and eleven. Do we have a three and thirteen year? Yes, that was the uh, last year of uh, Foxy. So that was 16, 15? That would have been 17. See, like, I started to try to forget. Right. Like, this S- is... 16 is Tampa, like, you know, and, like, that's, for me, it's a vivid moment for me, the shovel pass that... Yeah, the shovel changed pass your career. To, changed your to, career. That really changed a lot of stuff. Um, and I remember Dave Magazoo blaming my technique on the play, which is, you know... <laughs> Classic Dave Magazoo. I'm sitting in the training room with my leg is black. Right. <laughs> He's like, you tr- you know, you're trying to get sexy down there doing that, you know, whatever yeah, I, it was. I was trying to get sexy calling the calling the shovel pass to the Australian rules football football. We ran a deuce. We deuce blocked. It was a great deuce block. Uh, the issue was obviously the transition between football in quarterback's hands and football in fullback's hands. And God bless uh, Paul. He was a really great teammate and uh it was just unfortunate next thing you know you you yeah your season's over and you're you're in the training room for what I you mean, didn't know more than, yeah that was more than just so you're gonna be injury. there you're gonna be there for a very long time the highs right like you brought up week 17 of 2013 your rookie year my first year here back on the beat the first game of 2019, the playoff game, obviously, against the Eagles. I, I, I can recall turning off the Dan Ryan onto Lakeshore Drive and not even being out of the car yet and feeling the electricity of the environment. And I think that's what Chicago is trying to find on a consistent basis where it's like every time you go to the stadium for a seven or eight year period, you're going to have that feeling. But you recall those moments of like, Heading so glad into you the stadium for right those now. games. I want to pause this right here, like not pause this, but I want to pause in my mind where where you just took me. Um, yeah. So I work at CBS on Sundays, and I got lucky because we we covered the Super Bowl this year, and I got lucky that the Chiefs were in it because I know some of those guys really you got well. To do some interviews with them. So I got to fly to Kansas City the week prior to the AFC Championship. Um, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the week between the Super Bowl and the AFC Championship. Yep. And I got to yep. fly out there and I interviewed the offensive line. And if you haven't seen it, check it it's out. Great stuff. Yeah, please watch that. Um, but in my visit there, I got to see a lot of old friends, including Sir Matthew Nagy. Okay. And we had the best laugh I have ever had. Like when he ran up behind, I was talking to coach Tobe, special teams coach and i got put in a headlock from behind and i was like this is one of my buddies for sure and i turned around it was naggy and my smile was so big when i saw him and he laughed so hard and he was like is he telling is he telling you guys about how he's been talking shit about me the, you know since since <laughs> since, <laughs> since london week. and uh, you know i was like yeah i should you know blah 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 we had a great it was a, such a great interaction and i said i want to stop you coach while i got you here the check that Patrick made in, I believe it was the AFC Championship. It was against the Ravens. Uh, the check that he made on third and nine and threw it with the MVS over the middle. Right, yes. Do you remember, I said, was that the same play that Anthony Miller missed in 2018? Do you know the play I'm talking about? Which game? The double doink game. Do you remember the play I, I, I where don't. they got to zero? The Eagles got to zero. Mitch checked it. Oh, wait, he was I'm open. Gonna, I'm, I'm going to call it Halo. The check is Halo. Okay. And when you hear Halo, you know, okay, we have an answer here. Like, yes. we have an answer, and it's going to be good. And 
over Mahomes though, right? made that that check, and that's not what it's called. It's not called Halo. So he makes the Halo check, and he hits MVS or whatever. He sees Blitz, makes the check. I I said, is that the same? I now play that, remember exactly that, the play you're talking about that we didn't connect on. It was right before the kick, and he looked he looked at the coach standing next to him. And he was like, "This guy." He was like, "This guy doesn't <laughs> forget anything." And I was like, "It was that play. It was right before." That's the kick. how close we were. So. For Bears fans, we would have never gotten to double doink. Think about maximizing your opportunity to minimize those misses. You go get the best quarterback you can. The guy's name is Caleb Williams. He he's gonna be the guy that makes the check. He's gonna he's gonna be our Steph Curry. He's gonna be the guy with the ball in his hands. That's what you want. Two last That's things. I, I, we're going to end this on a high, but I have one more question just based on this topic of the three coaches you played for and having those moments where it, it, it shifted. Okay. How, how difficult is it to realize that, that what you thought, where you thought the staircase was leading is suddenly turned into a down escalator and you, you can feel that, you know, I know obviously we, if, if it gets to the point where we in the press room can feel the direction changing, certainly you guys in the locker room, can feel that, and and, and I, you did that three times here, where where it was like, man, we're headed to be somewhere. a good horse. You could be a good horse. You got to be blind a little bit. You got to have blind spots, and I developed really good blind spots thanks to the tutelage of some of the guys that came before me that played on some not so good teams, a la Chris Long, St. Louis Rams. They were so bad. They, they moved the team, Dan. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? The guy, the guy had eighty plus sacks in a in a dimly lit dome and never made a Pro Bowl. Chris That's never made a Pro Bowl. That's how That's bad true. their team was. Chris was as dominant an edge rusher as there was from, you know, the year his first ten years in the league. He was a very tough out. Okay, there's only a handful of guys like that. So I got to pick his brain, uh, and luckily I got the fan, the the great fans in Chicago. Even in rough years, they carried, uh, they you know they carried the mood for players. You were treated like royalty. Right. And that's one thing I love about Chicago is win, lose, or draw. They're, the fans love you, and they're going to treat you right. And we're seeing that with Justin Fields because right. he he did right by them. He played hard. He let his nuts hang for this team. And that's what the fans – that's all that they ask. That's all that they ask. Um, but we, we might get some more here coming down the pipeline. So, so that's the high one to end on because – that bridge from 2018 to the start of 2019 was as exhilarated as this city has been during my time on the beat without question. You were in Rosemont for that bears 100 weekend, which is, you know, again, I got goosebumps top of my head to the bottom of my toes right now, thinking about the anticipation and the energy that this city feels when they really, really love the team. You're at a white Sox game, your house and beers on the jumbotron, you know, like these are, these are the moments, right? And like the, the, the goal here is to not just have them for one summer, but to have them, you go to Kansas city, they're having them every summer. Do this every summer. Some of them, every I mean, like I played hard and I blocked just enough guys to where when I showed up at bourbon, a, people have my jersey on and people yelled my name and people knew, you know, people knew what was going on that you can't replicate that feeling. All you have to do is go play hard, prepare hard. And I'm telling you what, you can experience this forever. And when you're done playing, it doesn't stop. Like you don't have to go to training camp anymore. These people still love you. Like that's the best thing. Chicago has the coolest fans ever. It's you don't even have to be on the team and they love you. It's an amazing feeling, right? When it's going when it's going well, like I just I don't I know that there's a better it. place. I don't know that there's a better place for it. And it's, it's just fairy tale land when you go. When I come back to Chicago, it's always fairy tale land because people are all like the ch- the coolest people are Chicago Bears fans, and I I want what's best for the cool people in life, the good people in life, and I'll tell you what, you, you should be excited for what's going to happen here in Chicago. The media room has changed a lot since you were a young player and since I was first here, but obviously you had some experiences there. We used to have a, a Rich Campbell and I had a running joke in the uh, in the media room on if we'd go to talk to you on a certain day, it's like, did you get did you get good Kyle or did you get slightly irritable Kyle? Which uh, those days we understood it was just time to go talk to somebody else in the offensive line group and and get something else. But what what advice would you impart on a young player about understanding what you're coming into in a city that has so many different media outlets, so many different people? 
uh, to work with. I thought you, you did a, a wonderful job of finding the sweet spot of knowing when to, when to, to scratch people's bellies and, and make them laugh and, <laughs> and entertain them and, and, and how to, you know, put up a wall every once in a while and be like, guys, I got, I got my own shit to deal with. You know, just, just give me a day or two and I'll, I'll circle back with you later in the week. People are smart enough to digest the information you give them. Just make sure that uh, you don't leave people in the dark uh, because there's a side of being a fan that, this the itch doesn't get scratched by just watching you play uh, and i think a guy like jay cutler was an enigma he was an anomaly and people he was a polarizing guy and that's why he's such a cult hero in chicago <laughs> but that, that, that rarely happens you have to expose yourself it's okay to be human people need somebody that they can relate to and it's okay to feel a certain type of way about the experience that you're having because we're humans and we're playing a really, really tough game. Um, which is why I take issue with, uh, a lot of the folks that are anti emotions in football right. and, and, you know, these are kids. We, we fail to, to remember that these are kids go look at some of the birth dates of these guys who are coming <laughs> out in the draft and maybe that'll put it in first, but these, these, MFers were playing with Legos like seven years ago. So. Well, so that's my last question to get you out of here. You've got two of them in your house yep. there. How's fatherhood going? How old are the girls? It's now? amazing. Um, it's all. I mean, it's like nothing. I. It's like nothing I've ever done. Obviously, and I've One's got a two newborn, beautiful right? daughters. Yeah, I've got uh, you know, two daughters under two years old, and it's our oldest birthday next week so we're really stoked and it's a different adventure every day and it's a different version of your kid every day because they learn so much and uh it's fun to watch them interact the bigger one wants to hold the little one wants to hug her and you gotta be like because she's built my you know they're built like me a little bit they're giant children so uh <laughs> i have to be like very cognizant of uh preaching gentle you know gentle is our favorite word right now and you know it goes quick. I, I will share this story. My brother-in-law bought my son when he was, it was for his first Christmas, a Chicago Bears bib signed by none other than Kyle Long. It's in a shadow box. It says, eat your veggies, Kyle Long. That little dude is now 11 years old and and, and pitching, you know, and travel baseball. And, and so it goes fast, man. And, and like, it's just funny. I, you know, I see that bib every once in a while. I'm like, man, that was yesterday. And now here we are, right? So it moves uh, fast, I'm, I'm you know. I, it moves so fast, and uh, I'm glad you kept that. And I'm impressed that I was able. He's to not eating his veggies though, so he hasn't taken your advice. So that's rough. I, I think sure I got to go get some veggies for mine right now. Do you hear that? Do you hear my? I hear him. You've been generous with your time. You've been generous with our audience, Kyle. It's always great catching up. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Take the north, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll circle back up with you soon. Thank you, guys. Bye now. Take care.